Hello and welcome to second live stream of the year. This is uh, also the first uh, kind of webinar, a live webinar that I'm going to be doing this year. I'm going to be doing more of those. I think the uh, webinar I did on AI in project management in November 2022 was a big success. People seem to like it. People seem to like the learning format. So um, I've decided I miss doing live webinars. Uh, I just don't do as many uh, at the moment uh, as I have had been uh i had a big kind of the start of covid i had a lot of live engagements cancelled a lot of them went to live webinars but that kind of tailed off and it hasn't picked up as much as i'd like so i enjoy doing live webinars so i'm going to do them for you and i'm not going to charge which is great uh so uh welcome uh we're going to be talking about pmtq and digital literacy and uh, a range of other uh, ideas around the intersection of technology and commerce and professionalism uh, and all of its relevance to us as project managers. And I hope you'll see there's an obvious link with the theme of this channel for this year, which is artificial intelligence in project management. So uh, welcome to you. We've already got a couple of people said hello in the chat. I can see we've got, uh, I can never tell uh, with <laughs> with YouTube's font whether uh, uh, what appears to be a capital I might be a lowercase L, but I'm going to go with uh, Iamia and uh, Oma said hello. So uh, welcome to both of you. Please do uh, say hello if you'd like to um, in, in the chat. It's always good to know who we've got. Uh, and also tell tell us where you are in the world, what part of the world you're in, uh, and also uh, what your role is in the project management world, what your interest is in project management, and if you've got any uh, any questions you want. Um, we're going to do a short, brief kind of introductory section to this uh, webinar live stream, and then we're going to get into a kind of structured webinar. I'm going to try uh, something a bit different. We're going to go through the webinar. Uh, that should take um, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. It depends. You know, it's not heavily rehearsed. Um, and then I will do questions and answers at the end. If you want to cut in with an urgent burning question, uh, you can do that. And if you want to guarantee that I'll take your question as soon as I spot it, then you can use the Super Chat facility. Or if you just want to say thank you for a free webinar um, and, uh, and and make a small donation, that's absolutely fine. Um, now, I would say almost all of the work that I do is YouTube and therefore to a first approximation, all my content is free. So um, it's good to uh, it'd be good to get you know a little recognition if you feel you want to, but absolutely no obligation. The reason I've shifted to mostly YouTube is because I know that a large number of people around the world just can't afford to pay for project management training, which is why I like to make uh, free videos and write free articles for the website uh, for young new project managers who are learning. So. Um, uh, so if that's you, uh, then this channel is actually built for you. Um, so what else have we got? We've got uh, Kadir as well. So um, Omar is uh, working in the uh, UAE uh, on the LTRA project. LTRA, is that that big kind of strip city that is being built in the UAE? I'm not quite sure. Uh, a project engineer, so that's great. So some really good project management shops there, I should think. Um, so, uh, Kadir, uh, I am here, if I pronounced your names correctly, uh, please do tell us who you are. Oh, we've got Hambo Gumbo in the, in the live stream as well. Uh, welcome Hambo. Uh, thank you for your comment, uh, this morning on uh, the latest video. I was actually going to kind of uh, say a little bit about uh, my latest video because it's one I'm particularly, um, particularly proud of. Um, so as you may know, uh, some of the videos I produce are interviews and I've got a fantastic lineup of interviewees, uh, certainly for the first half of this year, pretty much the first half covered now with uh, interviews either uh, recorded, waiting to be edited uh, and released uh, or uh, lined up uh, and agreed. And um, the first one this year is with one of my project management heroes, probably my top project management hero. If I, if you'd have asked me when I started this channel 2016, um, hey Mike, you are going to be interviewing people. Uh, who would you most like to interview? Then the answer would have been Dr. Eddie Obeng, um, whose book, uh, All Change, 
uh, was kind of had a profound influence on me when I read it in the mid 90s when it came out. We got a hardback copy where I was working, and I since bought my own copy. Where is it? Ah, uh, lost it. There it is. So, um, all change, and uh, Eddie is probably one of the most charismatic people you will meet on the project management circuit. He's also one of the most innovative and creative uh, thinkers. Uh, the conversation we had I think was just astoundingly full of fantastic uh, insights so uh, if I can just uh, briefly flick across so that is the video that went up this morning on the channel uh, it's about 40 minutes interview uh, and there's just so much in it and Eddie is just the most remarkable personality um, I had to cut quite a lot out because he just went all over the place with interesting ideas and I just wanted to really focus it down on the key ideas for us as project managers so do go over to the uh, channel uh, after you've watched this live stream and have a look at that it's it's I think my favorite interview that I've done just because I've wanted to kind of meet uh, Eddie for so many years so uh, that's that's a that's a you know great thing about doing uh, what I do is I get to meet some fantastic people and I shout another shout out for um, another interview I did that has been on the channel now for about four months with Carol Osterweil about neuroscience and project management she wrote the fantastic book on the subject uh, here it is neuroscience in, uh, for project success brilliant book and I did an interview with Carol um, on the back of hearing her speak about uh, the book at uh, the Association for Project Management Conference and really wanted to have her on the channel. And it, she is an old colleague of Eddie Obeng's and, and kind of facilitated the introduction. So thank you very much, Carol. Um, more about uh, neuroscience and project management at the end of this um, this live stream. Let me say a little bit about that. Uh, who else has signed on? Um, <laughs> ah, Hambo. Yes, uh, I'll add it to my ever burgeoning book list. Best 40 odd minutes uh, you'll have this week. Yes, absolutely. It really is. Um, certainly in the professional sphere. Uh, maybe your private life will have something better. What I would say about this book is fantastic as it is, Hambo, don't buy it. <laughs> um, Eddie kind of let this slip on the stream, so it's not a secret. Um, two seconds. Um, there's a second edition coming out later this year. That's it. Um, that's the uh, proofs uh, version that Eddie sent me, um, wh for which I'm really grateful, and I am about halfway through it. Um, so, um, if you can, if you if you can't wait, then pick up a <laughs> uh, a copy now. But there will be a new edition um, updated because this is a 1996 book, and of course, uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the graphics kind of look dated. Um, the ideas haven't haven't dated badly at all and I haven't spotted any substantial uh, uh, change in the ideas but the way they're expressed and the examples are brought way out to bang up to date um, and I'm expecting there to be more in the form of practical tools what I don't know is whether so this book is unusual in that uh, sorry the book is called All Change uh, with the subtitle of Project Leader's Secret Handbook but if I turn it around it's not. It's called the Project Leader Secret Handbook All Change, and it's actually two books uh, bound into one back to back. Uh, so halfway through, the book turns upside down. Um, don't know whether the new one will be in that format or not. Uh, so that's Eddie being innovative again. And the two go together because the All Change bit is the kind of story and the thought provoking piece, and then the Secret Handbook part is all the tools and techniques. So it's, it's, it's a great read. Um, there's links to it in the um, in the description to the interview, but as I say, there is a new edition coming out, so I don't want you to go buy it brand new and then moan at me because it's out of date. Uh, so there we go. Um, what else? Oh, we've got uh, Nicola in the call. Hello, Nicola. Uh, actually, I'd quite like to find out where people are. So we've got someone in the UAE. I know, Hambo, you're in uh, the UK, in the kind of London, in central London. Nicola's in Canada. So that's... That's three continents if we put UAE as is it Asia, Africa, 
It's not Europe anyway, uh, where <laughs> where Hambo is. Uh, so do tell us where you are. Um, uh, Ayamia, I'm an IT director also in uh, char charge, I think, of managing IT projects. Fantastic. Um, and uh, LTRA, long-term rate agreement for the installation of underground cables, electric distribution equipment, OHL tender. Wow, excellent. So, uh, numbers creeping up. Not, not a huge number of people uh, on the call today, but that's fine because most people watch these in replay, uh, no matter how you know how much you try to find a slot when people can watch live you know people have lives to lead and work to do and it's a global community and the Australians are all in bed uh, and most of the Indians are getting close to going to bed and that's a big chunk of my audience um, the uh, West Coast uh, North Americans are of course just getting up and uh, it, <laughs> the Europeans are just finishing work so it's uh, ideal for us I guess anyway I don't want to spend too long uh, on uh, the introductory bit, but I do want to, uh, on the theme of uh, people I'm hoping to interview but haven't yet set a date, uh, I want you to kind of tag a new uh, project management channel that I've become aware of, uh, which you could check out. Uh, please don't abandon my channel uh, for hers. Uh, just add it to your list and uh, see if there's anything for you. Um, so, uh, Andreana. Marshall uh, or uh, Dre, she refers to herself uh, on her uh, channel, um, has a uh, fantastic uh, channel. Let me just uh, get that up uh, called Project Academy. It's new. There's not a huge amount of content yet, uh, but it is coming uh, and what's there is good. Um, and Andreana is a relatively young project manager who talks about career and also scrum because she is not just a scrum master but actually a scrum trainer professional scrum trainer so um, there'll be some really good content on her channel uh, already and coming on the topic of uh, scrum so uh, do keep an eye out for that but the main business uh, today is to talk about the concept of PMTQ project management technology quotient and digital literacy and so I'm going to cut across to my presentation now and take you through uh, this uh, presentation and this is uh, as I say it's part of our year of uh, artificial intelligence in project management um, this is not specifically about artificial intelligence but of course artificial intelligence is kind of part of the technology digital landscape um, and so these are a way of talking about the kind of career assets that you need uh, or some of the career assets you need to thrive um, in the world of uh, artificial intelligence so let me uh, come across and check my slides are still working yeah so I'm going to start with a book written in the early 2000s, 2005 I think it was, uh, Ray Kurzweil uh, wrote a book called The Singularity is Near. And the idea, he introduced the idea of a singularity as being the point where machine intelligence and human intelligence match and machines start to become smarter than intelligence made famous by the Terminator movies but I honestly I should have checked this whether the first Terminator movie came out before or after this book and whether the idea of the singularity he was Kurzweil was riding on the back of a popular idea or whether uh, the, the popular idea was riding on the back of his thinking but the, the core idea here is that Human intelligence may be rising a bit uh, over the over the centuries. I think there is a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of evidence that IQs have been rising over the last couple of centuries. It's probably a bit flaky, and it's probably you know humans are humans, and we've been identical to all intents and purposes for thousands of years. Um, the biggest single change I think in the human genome over those last couple of thousand years is toleration for lactose as adults among a large part of the world's population um, however it, it it's likely that the cause is nutrition uh, and education but 
it, to the extent that IQ has any meaning, there does appear to be a kind of drift upwards generally for the entire global population in intelligence. So I'll be generous and give it a, 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 a nice steady upward slope for human intelligence, which is nice. Um, it means I'm cleverer today than I was yesterday. Oh, I'd like to think it does. Oh, look at that. Hambo Gumbo. First Terminator came out in the early 90s. Early 80s. I can read. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, machine intelligence, of course, didn't ha didn't progress very fast uh, at first, and it, it's accelerating, it's accelerating, and at some point um, it will cross over and exceed human intelligence. And that point where machine intelligence is equal to human intelligence, Kurzweil labelled the singularity. And... Um, he had this idea that the 1990s could have brought in what we called the information age. And the information age is about the ability we have to store and sort and organize and access vast amounts of information. This is the kind of meaning of big data, I guess. Um, at some time... Um, he said, we are going to move from a, to, into a transitional stage between the information age, which we are definitely in, or have definitely uh, achieved, and the singularity, and, and after the singularity is the post-singularity era, and he calls this the hybrid age, and this will be where machine intelligence is starting to use that information and is starting to catch up with human intelligence. Now, um, I think we are in the hybrid age. What nobody, I think, can safely predict is how long the hybrid age will go. And the other term that he introduced was the idea of digital natives. I think it was he that introduced it. Um, but digital natives are people brought up during the age of digital technology. Um, so I'm going to kind of peg it to... Uh, around 1996. Um, the, uh, yeah, Wikipedia actually um, has that term for 1996. Yeah, it was actually not part... Uh, it was not coined um, by Kurzweil. It was coined by Perry Barlow as part of what he called the Declaration of the, Inde of the Independence of Cyberspace. Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. Um, so digital natives are people who grew up in the digital age as opposed to digital immigrants who moved into the digital world as adults. I think I'm a digital immigrant. Um, I grew up with a Commodore PET and a BBC Micro, um, which was hardly big data. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think digital natives are probably people who were born um, in the late 80s onwards uh, which isn't me uh, anyway digital natives are, are those who are comfortable in with the internet and you know i look at my daughter and i look at her friends and they don't need any instruction in the way that we might have done uh, my age group might have done um, so if you're a digital native um, then you will be used to the shifting landscape. And so that's the kind of background to what we're going to be talking about. And just to put artificial intelligence into that picture, I just see um, artificial intelligence as, as today's big wave in the digital disruption uh, from the status quo ante, the, the period before um, digital computers really came into our lives, which I guess would be around the mid early no let's call it 1980 when people started using digital computers uh, in the home context and of course it was probably around the late 80s early 90s that lots of people were using computers in the workplace um by the way what i should say is there are a number of images of robots cyborgs whatever they are no idea. I think they're robots. Um, all of them are drawn to a, an instruction that I gave to um, 
OpenAI's Dahl E program. Uh, so if you, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of interest online and in culture about ChatGPT. As we're speaking today, I think Google announced that it will be launching uh, opening access for beta users to its um, AI software Bard. Um, and those are text driven uh, AIs where you can put a text prompt in and it can respond in text and it can search its recollections. Is that a word right? Is that a fair word? Recollections. You can search its recollections to answer your questions and it can do so in natural language. Even before ChatGPT came out, OpenAI, who owned ChatGPT, had uh, made available the Dahl E program. Um, it, it, along with Stable Diffusion and Midjourney, are the three big um, platforms you can access for uh, graphical AI. I've, I've tried all of them. Um, frankly, I think I've had the best results with Midjourney, but I hate the interface because it's through a Discord uh, group, and I hate Discord. Um, see, I'm not a digital native. Um, However, uh, Dahl E uh, gave some really great results for these particular things. So all of the robot images were created by Dahl E. Um, all I've done is extracted them from the picture uh, to put them into my uh, presentation. So uh, she's from she's made by Dahl E. So is he. Um, and the thesis of this presentation, reason for doing this presentation and, and webinar for you, is that the world needs project managers who understand the technology that they need to implement. To, di to lead digital transformations. You will be leading digital transformations. A large number of project managers around the world will be leading digital transformations. Those of you who aren't, if you're a, if you're a commercial engineer of some sort, uh, a project engineer, an IT, or if you're an IT director, you probably know a lot more about this stuff than I do. Uh, and I'm looking at you. I am, yeah. Um, but if you're you know, civil engineer, leading civil engineering projects, then yeah, maybe you will be using AI tools in the design work, in the quality control work and all the different aspects of your job. But a lot of project managers will actually be leading uh, digital transformation projects. So we need to know about this stuff. So the first bit of jargon that I really want to introduce you to is the idea of a digital quotient, which was coined by the McKinsey Group, um, and if you and, and I'll, there is a link to this the, their reports in the description that goes with this live stream. But I'll, I'll paste uh, paste the link into the chat uh, now um, for you if you want it. Um, McKinsey produced lots of great reports. Uh, if you are interested in the business side of what we do as project managers, if you recognize the importance of commercial acumen and business understanding, then do kind of subscribe to the McKinsey site. They produce, I think, about 20 different regular email newsletters on different topics that you can subscribe for. Don't subscribe for them all. <laughs> It'll just overload your inbox. But uh, there's lots of really good stuff they produce. And uh, once you're subscribed, you can download the PDFs and put them onto your preferred PDF reader or print them out nicely. They're great. Um, and they did a report in 2015, uh, which was called What It Takes to Build Your Digital Quotient. Or was that the follow-up? I think I put the follow-up report in. I think it should have given you the link to raising your digital quotient, uh, which is the one I'm referring to there. So I'll put that into the chat as well. <clears throat> Both links are in the uh, description. Excuse me. So they wrote this report, Raising a Digital Quotient. They looked at um, different organizations and they looked at 18 different practices. It's interesting because uh, I couldn't find a list of those 18 practices. I did find a video on their YouTube channel uh, where they mention the practices and the list has 17 of them. So I'm slightly confused by that. But they say in the report, by evaluating 18 practices, 
related to digital strategy, capabilities and culture. We've developed a single simple metric for the digital maturity of the company and they called that digital quotient. So digital quotient or DQ refers to an organization, not to an individual. You don't have a DQ, your organization has a DQ. Um, interestingly, I couldn't find anything much more recent. There was a little spate of stuff came out at that time and then they seem to have dropped it, uh, which is a shame. But other people kind of picked up on the idea and, and interpreted it and did it slightly different ways. Um, in Psychology Today, uh, there's a British uh, psychology ma magazine, uh, 2017, John Noster uh, described the idea of a technology quotient representing a person's ability to adapt to and integrate technology as compared to some statistical norm or average for their age taken as 100. So he was very clearly, as a psychologist, echoing the idea of IQ. Um, and that idea of IQ is it's a, humans have a spread of intel, intelligence quotient um, and the arbitrary average is set at 100. And therefore, if you've got an IQ over 100, then you are smarter than the average person. There's lots of problems with IQ and its misuse over the centuries, <laughs> over, that, over the years. Um, so I'm not a big fan. Um, my, when I was a kid, my parents sent me to get a, an IQ test um, in the hope that I might be able to join the High IQ Society in the UK, um, which I was invited to join, but I refused to on the grounds that I thought back then, which was in the 19, late 70s, early 90s, uh, early, early 80s, can't remember quite when it was, uh, but I, I reckoned a lot of the questions were culturally biased, and so I refused to join. Um, now, actually, the idea of a technology quotient goes way back, even before the digital quotient idea of uh, McKinsey's. No slide for this, but um, if you go searching on the web, you can find that um, PayPal actually built a web page. You, you can't actually do the test now, but PayPal built a web page, and the Wayback Machine has access to some of it uh, that allows you to test your technology quotient. So, the technology quotient idea the term has been around for what is it, uh, 15 years now. Um, and people were giving thoughts to how you might measure technology quotient back then. I think uh, now. Uh, our ideas of what would be in it will be different to what they were in 2007 and so consequently it probably does no harm that you can't use the tool to test it. But that definition that John Noster gave is a good one, uh, but I actually prefer uh, one that appeared uh, same year from John Burton uh, in a presentation that he gave about technology quotient and the digital skills gap. And he talked about um, our ability to assimilate or adopt technology changes. Um, by developing and employing strategies to successfully include technology in our work and life. And he then started talking about what actually makes a high TQ, which is right attitude, right capabilities, right decision-making strategies to fully leverage technology. So it's a kind of basket of, of abilities relating to technology. And he said that if you've got a high TQ, a high TQ you can organise your work, to take full advantage of the technology you have available to you. Uh, you can get payback from using that technology and in particular taking risks with that technology, which I think is interesting and, and problematic uh, as an idea, uh, but also take advantage of the opportunities technology presents. And of course, risk and risk and opportunity or threat and opportunity are the two sides of the risk coin. So uh, that's great. Um, however, we're project managers, so in ways uh, the Project Management Institute. Uh, one of the few occasions, I think, where the Project Management Institute's thought leadership was ahead of uh, the curve in many ways, uh, the project management curve. So Project Management Institute does an annual... They skipped a year uh, in 2021, I think. Um, but apart from 2021, they do an annual Pulse of the Profession report. And 2019 was a, a big shift away from the way that they had been doing it. Up till then... They'd been doing surveys of the profession and they'd been drawing fairly predictable sorts of conclusions about uh, different aspects, the core kind of aspects of project management in companies. But this time they didn't give us all of their data. They just drew one. They, they just produced a report which was about um, 
technology quotient, um, which was called the future of work leading the way with PMTQ, in which they they did not define, they coined the term PMTQ and failed to define it. I mean, for goodness sake, PMI. What were you thinking? They didn't define PMTQ. However, uh, they did define technology quotient as a person's ability to adapt, manage and integrate technology based on the needs of the organisation or project at hand. So I guess PMTQ is that definition, but that's not how it's expressed. Um, so I, it, it was an interesting and, and a good report. It was like most PMI reports. Uh, flawed in its in its use and interpretation of data, drawing conclusions that they the data didn't appear to they don't give you all the stuff, so you, you can't be sure. But the data they give you does not justify the conclusions. It doesn't conflict with the conclusions. It's just that there's not enough fact in there. Uh, but it was a good report. So let's let's take a look. Um, oh, uh, so. They identified six what they call digital age skills and uh, just flicking through my notes just to remind myself of, of what those are. Yeah. So um, we've got data science, security and privacy knowledge, legal and regulatory compliance, ability to make data driven decisions, uh, innovative mindset and collaborative leadership. So there's quite a kind of spread of different ideas in there. And I when the report came out, I did a review of the report and an evaluation um, on which chunks of this uh, webinar are based. Um, again, the link to that, my original uh, analysis, is in the uh, description. But I predicted at the time that they would change the um, PMI talent triangle to introduce a fourth side to it and, and have a tetrahedron uh, or square, I suppose, but I drew it as a tetrahedron with um, leadership, technical project management and strategic and business management as they were then the three sides of the triangle and to add to that digital acumen or perhaps technology quotient or whatever. They didn't. They they revised the um, uh, the PMI's lead uh, talent triangle last year uh, and all they did was tinker with the namings, uh, the terminology. They didn't add an extra side to it. And I think that's a, a, a missed opportunity. They've abandoned one of their few, I thought, exceptionally good reports in terms of really breaking new ground and, and getting us to think in new ways. Um, and there's, there's a particularly nice part of it, which I'll come to. Um, and they didn't uh, introduce this into their uh, talent triangle, which I think is a missed opportunity. So I'm going to adopt my own simple definition of technology quotient because I think it's too many words in most of those. I'm going to say TQ measures the ability of a digital native to work effectively in the hybrid age. I'm looking at that now thinking, well, what about us digital immigrants? So actually it should be the ability of a person to work effectively in the hybrid age. Oops, slap on the wrist for me for not spotting that uh, for three years. Um, now, there's another term which has been in use, which I want to mention, which is the idea of digital literacy. Now, digital literacy uh, is another one of these terms that isn't uniquely defined. I can't find anything that looks like an authoritative definition of digital literacy. Lots of kind of similar definitions out there from which I've crafted my own. So this is my definition. Um what it did occur to me was to ask ChatGPT to define digital literacy, and then I kind of ran out of time. Should have done that. Uh, but I'm going to define it as possessing the set of skills we need to live, work, and thrive in today's society where we learn, work, communicate, and socialise through digital. So this one's kind of really focused on uh, just living in, uh, in, in society. And I think this is this is a broader set of skills than just the ones that you're going to focus on in the workplace and also I think these are the kind of foundational skills that we should be teaching our children and again if you look you look up digital literacy on the interwebs 
Um, you'll find no consensus on what skills make up digital literacy. Uh, you'll find lots and lots of lists, as I did. Uh, I kind of read through a load of lists, made some notes, and then organised my notes, and then added a couple of things that didn't seem to be there uh, to create my own list my own set of digital literacy skills. I don't pretend it's completely comprehensive. Um, uh, and it, these terms are kind of, each of the terms in there is open to interpretation, but there's the, a set of communication skills. And the one I'm going to pull out because I think it's not as obvious, social interaction using digital. You know, that is a, that is a skill that most people haven't mastered. Elon Musk um, and people like him who... I think continually get they get it wrong on Twitter, um, uh, and, and and are making Twitter you know an unpleasant place for some people. Um, that's a complete fail, and and that's why I put empathy on the end. I think empathy is a digital literacy skills because skill because while we fail to recognise that on the other end of a digital communication is a human being with a heart and a soul, and we feel like it's okay to be an utter and complete bad person. Uh, in the way that we deal with other people through, then that is a la failure of, illiter of empathy and f I think a failure of, of proper digital literacy. You would not expect to consider someone to be a literate, intelligent person if all they did was they insulted people in the real world. So why would we expect that to, to give them that uh, level of respect if they insult people in the digital world? And there's a whole load of learning stuff. And I think this is this is really in, made interesting by ChatGPT. Wired Magazine do some fantastic YouTube videos, and they did one which I watched today, which was a high school English teacher, American high school English teacher, um, setting five successively more advanced English assignments to ChatGPT and marking ChatGPT's work. Uh, and some on one of its works, it, it got a see me. Uh, didn't get a, a grade. It, it, I think it got an F on one. Uh, got a couple of C pluses, and it got a couple of A's. So all over the place there. But um, finding content, but is important, and the ability to consume content online and, and digitally is important. But critical evaluation is so 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 important. Um, there's a fantastic tool out, and I've, I've forgotten its name, and I'm not going to waste time trying to find it because it won't be quick. But there is a tool out there now for educators, and if you're an educator uh, and you want to know about this, let me know. And get in touch with me, ping me through the uh, comments or the chat, and, and I will find it. Um, it's a tool that is able to, you're able to feed in some text, and it will estimate the likelihood that it's written by a human being or by an AI. Um, anyone can use it, but if you're an educator, you can get an educator's account, which allows you to do more with the tool. Um, uh, so if you're an English teacher and you set a, a an assignment or a history teacher and you say yeah tell me about the history of the american civil war or tell me the history about the napoleonic wars in europe um you can then take a chunk of that essay put it through the um that, that your student provides put it through the uh the tool and it will give you a uh, an estimate of how likely it is to be human or how likely it is to be ai generated um working of course going clockwise uh, around uh creating content of all sorts, digital uh, digital content of all sorts, from text to video to imagery to uh, music, all sorts of stuff. Collaborating, big one, and that that's that's an area where uh, we're we're seeing a lot of use of AI already. I think um, just the ability to have stuff translated or transcribed is a collaboration tool. It's fantastic. But now thinking about how do we use uh, technology to manage and to lead people, and how do we ma manage the vast amount of data? that we are gathering and need to understand and make use of. And finally, on there is citizenship, which is what, you know, fundamentally why we need to teach our kids about real digital literacy. They're digital natives, so they speak the language natively. It's like your children come into the world, if they interact with you in a healthy way uh, with adults and with other children, then they will pick up language. They, they don't need to be taught to speak their native language. They just pick it up. However, literacy is the ability to read and write, and that needs conscious teaching. And so we need to consciously teach our young people uh, digital citizenship, uh, how to adapt to the changes and cope with the changes. And, and I think there's a lot of evidence in the UK, um, and our school, my daughter's school has been telling us about this, about the fact that uh, 
you know some young people are really struggling to cope with some of the flood of information that's available to them particularly through platforms like tiktok um and, and so coping i suppose as well as adapting to change uh, participating in society how do we how do you use digital soft digital uh media to participate in society to participate in democracy for example um social responsibility how do we use this stuff in a responsible way uh and how do we use it to be socially responsible um there's a in the uk again because i get the uk news so my apologies to, to the non-uk people here but i'm sure it's similar in your countries um there's recently been announced a new university course first university course which teaches not just sustainability but how to campaign for sustainability which is a kind of i'm, I'm sure covers the use of digital media um, to campaign and then how do you stay safe particularly for young people but you know what the threats that are scary to young people are scary to me too as a grown-up uh, the possibility that my digital access to my money might be compromised uh, the possibility that i might may fall for a spoof email or um, uh, the possibility that i may get something in my email stream or on my browser that i really don't want to be looking at i mean i'm a grown-up but you know we all have a threshold uh for things that are going to make us feel uncomfortable and uh, whatever that threshold is we need to be able to make ourselves safe i mean i think my perspective if we're going to live in society we can't expect society to stop producing content that other people in society legitimately want legal content that may be uncomfortable to me is legitimate i'm not for censorship um i, I am for um controlling people's uh use of speech and and, and media uh, that might intimidate or or threaten uh, but you know there's a lot of stuff that's legal and i need to feel safe that i can understand how to screen that out for myself so there's a huge amount in this digital literacy and i've been trying to think of a clear distinction between t technology quotient and digital literacy and i think technology quotient is really about our ability to assimilate new stuff whereas digital literacy is about having the basics so back to technology quotient here is the report the pulse of the profession report that uh, pmi produced in 2017. is it 2017 2019 2019 my apologies um and again there is a link to that uh report oh i think i forgot to paste a link to that report in the description i will do that later but there are links to my there is a link to my article and my video about pmtq both of which will have links to that report just go to the pmi's website and search for pulse of the profession and look at the 2019 report it's called the future of work um, leading the way with pmtq and in that uh they made the assertion that what they just they, they split their survey group into two this is something pmi likes to do it takes the best and gives them one label and it takes the worst and gives them another label in this case the best performers were pmtq innovators the poorer performers were pmtq laggards um and then it shows and then it kind of looks to see how that correlates with project management and their assertion is that pmtq innovators who put a higher priority on digital skills and knowledge than pmtq laggards have far higher scores across a wide range of project management processes and capabilities which seems very compelling let's be a pmtq innovator i think this is an absolute case of correlation is not the same as causation i don't think being a pmtq innovator makes you better project management i think the kind of organizations that are minded to innovate in the pmtq zone are also the kind of organizations that are likely to work hard at developing and in training and ingraining and in for we're well not enforcing but creating a culture where project management is done well so i think this is a correlation rather than causation thing however i think the, there are some really good ideas uh in that report and here is my favorite this is this is what i think is the cleverest part of the whole report and the reason why i think this is probably the best of their reports that i have read um and i and i think i the first one i read was the 2016 
Pulse of the Professional Report, and, and I've read everyone since 2016. As I say, the 2021 they missed. Um, and I, and I, by the way, on my website, all of those Pulse of the Professional Reports since 2016, I've done a write up and a review and an assessment of them, so you can you can get that um, there. But what I what I thought was really clever is if I were if I were thinking about how to define high PMTQ, high project management technology quotient, the obvious things I might have come up with, and I, these are the ones I put in my uh, in my article, are knows a lot about technology, readily adopts new tools, uh, comfortable with change, those kind of things. But they didn't pick those kind of things. They picked three very interesting ideas, uh, which I, I thought were very, very compelling. The first uh, is what they call an always on curiosity. And I love this because I think curiosity is the master skill for a professional in the world of work. Uh, if you are curious about stuff, then you will learn about it. And if you are curious about things, you can solve problems. If you are curious about things, you'll gather the information that will make you help you make better decisions. If you're curious about things, you become more interesting to the people around you and therefore a better influencer and a, a better colleague. And people will, I think curiosity is great but interestingly their focus in talking about always on, curi always on curiosity is really about experimentation a willingness a desire a passion to experiment and try new things so uh, that one's nice and then we've got this all-inclusive leadership and i thought mm, that's interesting What's that all about? Because I'm all for all inclusive leadership. You know, I kind of grew up as a project manager. I grew up as a as a as a young adult, and, and then as a project manager in a world where, um, in the UK, we were really starting to take equality and diversity seriously. Um, and that's not to say the problem solved here in the UK uh, or probably anywhere in the world. But you know, we're doing better than we were uh, when I was a teenager in the seventies, um, and so. I have always been convinced by the evidence which demonstrates that the more diverse your project team is, if you manage that diversity well, if you celebrate the differences and you make everybody feel an equal part of the team, uh, then you can get better results from a diverse team. And I thought, well, you know, that's, that's obvious, but what's that got to do with PMTQ? The answer is, of course, that at some point we are going to have artificially intelligent team members. We are going to have robots and computers as part of our teams. And NASA, they, they describe back in 2019, was already doing that. And uh, I recorded a, an interview with um, a an artificial intelligent, well, a a software provider who is building artificial intelligence into their project management software as we speak. And he also uh, gave uh, some example of organizations with AI project team members. And that, of course, you know, we, we've struggled for thousands of years as human beings to uh, really treat people who look a little bit different to us as equals. And... I like to think some of us are getting pretty close to the ideal on that one of, of, of being able to do that without thinking. But the psychology evidence shows that we're not really there yet as a, as a species. Um, it, we're not great at treating people that we grew up with, but just happen to be a different gender to us or have a different different preferences to us as equals. So what about when what is sitting across the desk to us is made of composites and plastics and metals and thinks in very 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 different ways to us i mean maybe that's the one thing we really need uh, to start treating other human beings as real equals is actually seeing how different a brain can be a mind can be uh, to a to the human human mind and, and maybe then i'll start to see um, the minds that are fundamentally the same as mine that just grew up in a different culture as as being a lot more similar to mine so that i thought was really fascinating and then this one is, is, is so important and, and it's, it's what this channel is all about, a future proof talent pool. The idea of not just to be 
to have a high PMTQ, we must learn about this stuff. But as a project manager, to have a high PMTQ, you must be creating opportunities for your team to learn, to develop and create new skills. And this is about constantly, constantly retraining and upskilling your team because, you know, if you're... If your mobile phone is out of date and a new one comes out, I'm not a big fan of throwing it away and getting a new one because of all of the sunk energy and materials in it and the, and the poor state of recycling and, and uh, chains around the world. But you can do that if you choose. But you know what? Humans and human intelligence is still going to be a scarce resource and you can't throw away team members because they don't have the technical knowledge that they need for the next project. That's just ridiculously wasteful. So we need as project leaders to be training our people constantly to be prepared for the next technology challenges. So... Why does this matter? I really don't think I actually need to put this slide up. I think, you know, if you're on this, if you're attending this webinar, either live or you're watching it in replay, you don't need me to tell you. This matters because we, project managers, will need to live and work in the future. And the future is part of the hybrid age, possibly the future, well, somewhere in the future is the singularity. But it also matters because as project managers, we will be the ones who built much of that future. You know, who builds the new stuff? Who changes the world? It's project managers. Who builds the new roads? It's project managers, along with civil engineers and, and labourers and all sorts of things. But, you know, who builds the new technology infrastructure? It's scientists and technologists and engineers and project managers. So, you know, we are part of that. Um, so, of course, it matters. Now, the third of the PMIs, characteristics of high PMTQ was to future proof talent pool so how how do you develop your team this is by the way uh, not PMTQ specific uh, you can you can apply this uh, formula which is you know, basically something I've been talking about ever since I moved from active project management into educating project managers and educating managers and professionals um, but you know you first thing you need to do is inventory the skills find out what people already know what they can do if you've got the right skills already your job done and and actually you get with a bit of cross training amongst your team and, and information sharing you may be able to shortcut this whole thing but if there are gaps between what you need or what you predict you will need in the next business cycle and the next one after that because the further you can predict then the sooner you can prepare well, basically good project management i guess um then you need to create a business case for the investment developing your team takes time and it takes resources and it, therefore it costs money it's an investment it's not a cost it's an investment because it will bring a return but you need to create a business case for that investment because your finance director is going to say why should i train all our people to do stuff they don't need to do today Once you've sold that internally, you can then specify, procure, design the learning programs. And then you need to operationalize continuous learning, which means continuously specifying, procuring, designing more and more learning. And that can be formal. Yeah, go out to an expert in the stuff your people need to learn about. Pay them to come in and, and train them in some way, whether it's through online training, video based training, live training, reading, whatever. But don't forget the informal training. Get your people together at a lunchtime and ask someone who's learned about something on the job to share their learning or you know, bring in people who can talk about stuff. Um, I just noticed that there has been some chat and uh, uh, I <laughs> noticed that uh, Amber Gunn was a cough benefits. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hambo. Uh, is one of the regulars on on uh, my channel and knows that um, I bang on about the importance of benefits and value um, all the time. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to have a quick look at the chat. Uh, what have you got? We've um, uh, we're definitely in an area in, in a new era with AI. Uh, I liken it to gunpowder. Says Don Five O N Don Sone. 
Uh, yeah, gunpowder changed changed uh, warfare and it changed engineering massively. And and this stuff will probably change both of those as, uh, and more to come. Ah, Hamba Gumbo, using his uh, his status as a moderator, has very kindly put the link to uh, the uh, PMI uh, website, which I suspect, although the the link is truncated in the way it shows on my screen, uh, I'm sure it works perfectly well. Uh, but that I expect is the link to the Pulse the Profession. Uh, Nicola says he agrees with this assessment. No idea when that came through, so uh, I'll just take it, Nicola, that you agree with everything I say um, because I'm right. <laughs> but then you know that uh, I'm open to discuss anything. Uh, Don Sone, Don Five O N. Um, this time, this time, this technology is so different from others. The need for humans to do work is becoming not not ne not not necessary. Uh, most of the disciplines AI does seventy five percent of the work already. Yeah, I mean the real challenge is that I think AI is going to strip the middle out of society. The people at the very top of society won't give up their their prerogatives. They'll use AI as a tool, but they will do the work because of the power that comes with it. Call that politics, call that reality, uh, as you choose. Um, and the people at the bottom of society, um, in whatever culture you're in, I suspect their jobs are going to be the hardest to get AI to do. I mean, you know, frankly, ChatGPT might be able to write me a history essay. It may be able to solve a physics calculation, but it ain't going to empty my bins on Friday morning. Uh, and take my garbage away and well, hopefully someone will build robots to do that but then you know we need to re-engineer this isn't this is way off topic but if that happens if we have a a robot to empty my garbage and let's face it nobody wants to do that job but people want a job <laughs> people want a job because they want something meaningful to do with their lives and they want a job because they want some money to 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 spend on doing the meaningful things uh, like looking after their family and enjoying their life uh, so we are going to need to re-engineer society if this happens we, we do not want a brave new world style of society where everyone is anaesthetised uh, by Huxley didn't call it social media but I will uh, but we want a society which is rich so we're going to have to think about uh, everybody getting some sort of Minimum amount of funding from the state, perhaps. The Americans won't like this. I'm not sure we've got any on the call at the moment. But, um, you know, some, some minimal funding from the state so that everyone can live happily and safely and uh, healthily. Uh, and and then people can use their time as they choose, maybe. I don't know. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be uh, too deep. Uh, fundamentally, project is about getting the best out of people, in my experience. Mine too, Humbo. Humbo Gumball. Uh, two elected officials drafted legislation to regulate artificial intelligence technology with some help from Jack, Jack GPT. Link below. OK, uh, so Don 5 an if you're not a moderator, and I think this is your first time on the call, so I don't know you, so I'm not instantly going to make you a moderator, uh, but then you can't paste links. So if you paste it not as a link, just as text, then people can grab that link. Uh, uh, grab the text and turn it into a link for themselves. Uh, I'd be interested uh, for you to do that if you would, um, but you won't be able to paste it as a link. I'm afraid a clickable link. Uh, uh, either that or put it in the comments. You can paste links in the comments, but not in the live chat. Uh, right, Nicola. Tom Ferry's leadership competency framework have a competency called being tech savvy. Yeah, the TQ isn't isn't. Uh, the only game in town uh, their book in their book called FYI for your improvement they have great ideas on how to develop this competency okay Corn Ferry Corn Ferry are the people who bought the uh, Miller Hyman business uh, so I'm guessing they're a big uh, consultancy uh, Miller Hyman is a sales consultancy um, the reason I I know Corn Ferry bought Miller Hyman is because on my other channel management courses uh two new courses are rolling out through the first and second quarters of 2023 they both started a couple of weeks ago and one of them is sales skills and sometime in the moderate future uh, of that course uh, there is a 
a video which I made a call about the Miller Hyman methodology and I went looking for the Miller Hyman website and found because I've got one of the books but I thought I'd have a look at the website and then found that Corn Ferry had bought them so interesting uh, so yeah uh, Nicola because you're a mod you can paste links into the chat so if you have a link and are willing to do feel free to paste a link in there for that book um, so they define this competency similar to how you define it, anticipating and adopting innovations in business building, digital and technology applications. Nice definition. Uh, yes, they bought many boutique consultancies. Maybe yours one day, Nicola. Uh, it'll, you'll, you'll think, you know what, it's time to sell and take the family to a tropical island and sell up your consultancy. I'll cross my fingers for you, uh, but obviously not until they bought mine. Anyway, uh, let's get on with the, uh, we're, we're up to date on the chat, let's get on with the uh, presentation. Um, basic project management technology quotient skill set. So, PMI started us off on this. Some of these are in their, in their Pulse of the Profession uh, report. Um, others I've added. So I think uh, as a project manager, these are the skills. Not We're not going to need to go in depth into IT service management or DevOps. Of course we're not. But I think it will be useful for us to know about them. I have a video, what is ITSM? But I don't actually yet have a video, what is DevOps? I must remember to uh, put that on my backlog. Uh, we need to know a bit about data analytics. We need to know a bit about data protection, data security. Of course, we need to know about agile methodologies and how to hybridize because agile methodologies are currently how we do all of the technology or most of the technology uh, development as project managers. You know, uh, much as I hate the term waterfall, it was set up as a straw dog uh, to bash project managers with. It didn't really exist. Uh, you know, waterfall methodology is a, you know, a bit of a bit of a misnomer, but the idea of the waterfall, yeah, it is not suitable for technology projects where you need to develop as you go. So we need to understand that. We need to understand design thinking because that's a great way to start thinking about designing digital technologies and digital solutions. And of course, we need to understand change management because. All of this stuff is going to bring about changes in our organizations and in our society. Um, and finally, of course, artificial intelligence technologies. We need to get to grips with that. And that's the PMTQ stuff. The whole of the rest of the project management skill set, risk management, stakeholder engagement, benefits management, uh, cost management, resource management, all that stuff. We, we need to know that. Um, and of course, there's all of the other soft skills, because as Hambo says, fundamentally, project management is about getting the best out of people, which means we need to be able to communicate. We need to inspire and motivate. We need to lead all of that stuff. And we need to understand business and we need to understand politics and we need to understand psychology. and all that. So um, we've got a tough job as project managers. Right, winding to the end, um, I talked a bit about how do you develop PMTQ in your team. Um, how do organisations need uh, to respond? And this is, again, this is a list that I've kind of taken PMI's ideas and developed them a bit in, in my own kind of direction. Uh, first, we need to adopt an experimentation and portfolio mindset. So what do I mean by that? Firstly, the experimentation mindset comes from their idea of always on curiosity. We need to be experimenting and trying things out. But of course, we we can't try anything we want, but we also can't play it safe all the time. So the portfolio mindset says, let's define a set of uh, approaches, ideas, experiments that we're going to try. Um, some of them need to be high degree of confidence that they're going to succeed and produce a, a return. Others can be wild guesses that may have a huge return but may fail spectacularly. We need that portfolio mindset and we need to think about the risk profile that we want for each portfolio. Um, I think our organisations need to start teaching, uh, treating digital literacy, which I think they do already to a degree, and high technology quotient. So um, uh, as core competences as part of every person spec. So here I'm not talking about project management alone. But then we come on to my third one, which is I think we also, our organisations should be creating career paths for high technology quotient and high PMTQ individuals. These are people who want to really focus in on this. And 
we need to recognize their value to the organizations as professionals uh, and, and maybe there will one day be a a name for a digital professional i don't know um and of course we need to build high tq and digital literacy into the person spec of project managers which means and i said this when i did my webinar in november about ai we need to be building this into our uh, professional qualifications and certifications for project managers because if if you're going to certify that someone is, is, is a skilled and able senior level project manager then we've got to as part of that certification have assessed their level of pmtq um without a doubt and finally and and this is, uh yeah we're coming up to uh, an hour of me speaking about this so timing is about right uh, finally i would say um we need to create the training programs that will diminish our dependency on recruitment. What I mean by this is that there will be a huge demand for people with high TQ, high digital literacy, high PMTQ. We can't just go out and recruit everything we need because the competition will be too high and we can't as I said before, be getting rid of people who don't have a high TQ and replacing them because that's wasteful. So instead, what we need to do is be building training programs within organisations that mean that we can take the people we've got and make them into the people we need, rather than relying on throwing away the people we've got who don't do what we need and going and finding them. That's more expensive, it's more wasteful. Um, and it's less certain because every time you hire a new hire, you're taking a, a risk as to whether personality wise, attitude wise, um, broad skill wise, they are what you thought they were at interview. Whereas you know about the people who are working with you and for you because you've had experience of them in the real world. So take them and develop them. So last slide, uh, a little bit of an advert. Um, I will, I think, be trying to, I forgot to record this call. Uh, obviously, it's going out on, um, it's going out on YouTube, so I can, and I can access it, I think. I'll, I'll see if I can figure it out. Uh, so I may or may not uh, be putting this onto this, but onto it. But um, I have a product. Um, it is a low cost. It's not a course. It's kind of a briefing. I call it a briefing. Um, it's artificial intelligence and project management it's got an edited version of the webinar that i did back in november it's will have pre-release fully edited versions of all of the uh, artificial intelligence content that i create for this channel uh, i tend to create content between one and three months in advance so there's already a couple of interviews on that product which will not be available free on youtube for another month or two it's got assets in there that are just not uh, available uh, anywhere else uh, including uh, checklists and the decode the jargon of artificial intelligence ebook i'm keeping it up to date i've actually put two new uh, additional lists of content that you can be looking at uh, during january twice during january i've added uh, links to new AI related content of interest to project managers so and, and there's a section where if you discover stuff you can enter that for your colleagues as well um, it's only $27 but with the coupon uh, discount code uh, yt-20 off uh, you can get 20% off that um, uh, on the back of this uh, thing I will put the the link is already in the um, description but i will add it to the chat so if you want to go and get that um, then please do it supports the channel it's not a huge amount of money but it will give you some some real value i believe so that's there and by the way if you're watching this on replay that's a fairly long-term discount for youtube viewers it's not a like only for this this week uh, thing it's a long-term thing so do try it out i think it probably lasts for the year so maybe longer um 
by the way, that $27 discounted down to twenty one sixty plus local taxes. So if you're like me and you live in the UK and you pay PAT or you're in Europe or whatever, the the, the website will calculate precisely how much tax you need to pay and, and add that to it. Um, of course, unless you use some clever VPN that you digital native people use um, <laughs> that makes it think you're in a, a jurisdiction without local taxes. Anyway, that's uh, that's all I was going to uh, say. So uh, we've got a couple of minutes uh, to take questions. So let me go back to me and my ugly mug. Uh, if you've got questions, thoughts, comments, uh, anything, I, I welcome those. I love I love questions. It doesn't have to be about this topic, by the way. You can pick a question that you know struck you while I was speaking uh, about this topic, or you can ask me any other question. I'll try and answer it. Uh, I'll, I'll stay on up to up to. Uh, 20 minutes longer um, depending on what we've got um, if you just want to say hi uh, feel free to do that um, and while you're thinking about that I will just uh, tell you that the next one of these live streams will also be a webinar format I think uh, I'm, I'm thinking about either discussing or having a structured briefing on the application of neuroscience to project management and, and I'll be leaning heavily uh, on that fantastic book that I mentioned before uh, neuroscience of project success but this is a topic I knew something about before reading the book so I should be giving you my kind of take on it uh, you may have noticed a couple of weeks ago on the channel one of the videos I released was what is the scarf what is scarf s-c-a-r-f uh, which is an acronym for um, that is a model, a, a neuroscience model from David Rock. Um, so do have a look at that. But we'll be talking about scarf model and, and other things, um, neuroscience, uh, on the 7th of March, same time, same place. Uh, might bring in some psychology as well. Haven't really planned it out in detail, but I think that's a that's a good theme for us. Um, I don't want to kind of go all technology every every month but i want to have a kind of regular cadence of technology stuff and in between recognize that fundamentally project management is about getting the best out of people um, and also content that recognizes that project management is also about the basics of project management you know the core resources costs schedules tasks all that stuff uh tunde Ade, hey you're back uh haven't seen you for a while uh what are the implications of ai for the project management roles okay First up, that was fundamentally the basis of uh, the November webinar. So do take a look at that, either free on YouTube or edited uh, in the um, in the artificial intelligence project management briefing uh, that I just plugged mercilessly shamelessly um, but a simple answer is that probably in the short term the biggest impact is going to be on the roles of people like project coordinators, project controllers, project admin, whatever you call them. And by the way, there's a video I did recently uh, on the channel, uh, how to be a good project coordinator. Um, so if that's a, an area that you're interested in because you are an AI and you want that job. <laughs> but I think those the, the, the thing, a lot of the things that project coordinators and project controllers do um, are much more ripe for AI to take over. Things like scheduling, planning, uh, cost management, predicting stuff. So there's there's a lot of AI now which is getting good at uh, portfolio selection. There's AI that's getting good at predicting uh, project outcomes, estimating timelines on projects. And so a lot of those kind of, ad not administrative, but high skill kind of control jobs are going to fall, I think, first to project management, uh, to AI. Now, on the face of that, that's fine for you if you're a project manager because that will leave you more time to deal with the politics, to deal with the strategic elements, to deal with the relationships with your team and the management of your team. To me, the problem is that a fair number of project managers learn about managing projects through being in a project environment by being project controllers or by being in a project management office with project control roles. If AI is starting to do these roles, 
then it's going to be harder to learn. One of the roots uh, of learning the craft of project management is going to become close to us. Other roots are still going to be there. Like we start the way I started project management wasn't in project control. It was managing small projects, which you could do largely with a bit of common sense and a hint from a colleague about a tool or a technique. And then you go on a course and you start incorporating more tools, more techniques, more structure into it. So it's not the end, but it, it does close off one route. Um, maybe in the deep future, AI will be able to do more of the kind of softer stuff um, and the more strategic stuff, but that's not currently on the roadmap, I think. So the follow-up question, do, do I think that we should be worried about AI? Um, we should be mindful of AI. We should be aware of what it's capable of doing what it's likely to be capable of doing and start thinking about the consequences of it but I, that, that doesn't mean we should be worried about it so first off there one of the assets in the paid briefing 27 dollars less 20 percent is a checklist of questions that organizations should be asking checklist of questions that the project management um organizations like PMI, APM, IAPM, IPMA, questions they should be asking themselves to serve us as a community and questions that we as project managers should be asking in response to this. But should we be worried? No. No, we shouldn't be worried. We should be mindful. And the reason, two reasons why we shouldn't be worried. Firstly, good old Stephen Covey, circles of concern. There is no point about worrying about things you cannot influence. Uh, and we can't influence the growth of AI. It's going to happen. So don't waste energy worrying about it. Spend energy preparing for it. Um, and secondly, every downside there may be, and there may be plenty of downsides, there can be plenty of upsides. And I think the only really scary thing is this idea of singularity and terminators and stuff. And I have no idea... You know, science fiction has as many stories, plausible, compelling, believable scenarios where AI takes over the world as there are plausible, compelling stories where AI is completely benign and leads humanity into a, a glorious future. Um, so, you know, and it's the same with, you know, should we be contacting, should we be putting messages out into the universe to contact alien races? There are plenty of stories like Star Trek, uh, where being part of a, a, a galactic community, a universe community, a community of different alien races, is exactly the right thing to do because we can benefit from it. But then, you know, you read Sishin Liu's um, Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy, Three Body Problem, and particularly the second book, The Dark Forest, and you think, oh, my God. You know, we are linking, leaking television and radio signals into the universe. People are going to find out, people, alien, other races are going to find out we exist and they're going to come and destroy us. It's the same, it's the same with um, artificial intelligence today in, in the sense that uh, we do not know whether it ultimately the, the doomsday scenarios or the utopian scenarios are, are likely to play out. But every fibre of my being recalls my constant experience that if you choose one of two extremes as your position, either it's going to be a disaster for humanity or it's going to be a wonderful utopia for humanity, then you are almost certainly going to be wrong. The reality is going to lie somewhere in the middle. And it's people like us, thinking, intelligent, curious, interested people who can get things done, who are going to mould the way the future plays out. And of course, that doesn't eliminate or, or minimise my view that, you know, politicians are going to have a big impact on this as well. And that's scary. I'm, I'm more scared of what politicians will do than what AI will do, uh, because they are the ones probably who are going to legislate uh, or not. Uh, yeah, Hambo, I'm curious. This question is from a point of fear. I mean, I didn't interpret it as a point of fear. I, I interpreted it as a question as to whether I'm, I am I would be fearful. And as I say, I'm not. Um, but I'd be interested to, uh, to see how any of you uh, on the call, but Tunde in particular, I guess, uh, respond to my thoughts. Uh, they are just my thoughts. They're, and to a degree, they are informed only by, you know, a, li a bit of knowledge. And a bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Uh, 
a little knowledge is a dangerous thing famous quote which fundamentally is a summary of the dunning kruger effect uh, which is you know dunning kruger effect is that uh, people who know a little bit overestimate how much they know and therefore underestimate the danger they uh, put themselves and others in uh, by believing in in what they know so i don't have a a settled view i have nothing more than an opinion but my opinion is don't spend your time worrying about it spend your time preparing yourself and the people around you in your professional lives for it if you've got a family and you've got young people in the family spend time helping them to be good digital citizens and safe digital citizens um and and, and those that's my views The other thing I'm aware, of, of course, is that I'm kind of looking at the chat, waiting for an answer, but <laughs> you're not hearing me until 20, 30 seconds after I speak, uh, and then the chat comes through 20, 30 seconds late. So, um, so put the 7th of March in your diary. Um, if there are responses to what I said, they should be coming through soon. So if I don't see any soon, I'll close the call and wish you all a... Uh, productive and happy and safe digital february and i'll see you in march as always uh, do feel free to get in touch with me you're part of my community so i welcome con direct contact from any of you uh, at least three of you on this list i've had direct contact with i think uh, so uh, the more i get to know you folk the more i can serve you uh, well so nothing else is coming through i think what i'm going to do is uh turn on a mental clock and maybe i've actually got i've got a timer give you another minute i think well, we'll i'll just put another put a timer on my no nope, not a timer a stopwatch because that won't make a horrible noise um so if you've got anything to say do say it if you've got anything to ask do ask it if you haven't i'll be ending the call uh 30 seconds my time 30 seconds after you hear this no sorry 60 seconds you can tell i've run out of things to say i'm better with questions <laughs> i am just wibbling on of course if you're watching this in replay you've got to keep watching to the very end because i may say something very very important <gasps> kevin's on the call still alive just want hello kevin it is great uh, to know you're uh, still alive. Uh, yeah, Kevin, uh, someone uh, who uh, is not a project manager but knows how to manage projects and uh, has a fantastic channel for anyone uh, wanting to start making their own uh, videos, uh, taught me a huge proportion of what I know about making videos and, and being on YouTube. Uh, Kevin's course on YouTube, being a YouTuber, um, has i think made my channel what it is along with me making videos so uh, it's great to see you uh you're still alive kevin uh, yeah it's been a while and we've been expecting you back uh, uh for a while so it's great that you are um which reminds me is it my turn to send out an invite no i think it's someone else uh anyway uh nothing else Kevin's alive. Uh, I think we've answered Tunde Ade's question. Can't see any other things in the chat that I need to respond to. So I am going to say thank you all very much for attending. Uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've learned from it. Hope you've got something valuable out of it. And I hope to see you on the 7th of March. Same time, same place. Thank you. <laughs>